Hey everyone, Beardo here with more Modern Age Batman history for ya. Um, yesterday we wrapped up with the Jason Todd Red Hood story arc that Judd Winnick brought to us over the course of about 15 issues of Batman. And at the end of it, as I said yesterday, everything came to a screeching halt with the um, onslaught of Infinite Crisis. And um, the thing that's important to remember as we go into these next few issues of Batman is when Infinite Crisis hit, um, it really sucked up a lot of the DCU. And Batman had surprisingly few sort of tie-ins to Infinite Crisis, um, other than basically that last page of 650. It really wasn't affected at all until one year later happened. Now, what is one year later? In Infinite Crisis, um, obviously, there is an infinite crisis that everyone's dealing with, blah, blah, blah. Story for another video. And um, at the end of it, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman disappear from the DCU. They go off, have to sort of find themselves, go off do their own thing, and there's this big void left for one year. Now, in the middle of Infinite Crisis is when basically DC sort of hit the jump to one year later button and all of the titles moved forward by one year, which meant everything got pretty much wiped clean, clean slate to do whatever you wanted with new story arcs, new storylines, and really create a good jumping on point for new readers who are getting on board with Infinite Crisis. Um, and then in that missing year, we get that in uh, DC's 52, which is the weekly book that came out basically after Infinite Crisis. So what that means for Batman, in terms of the actual Batman title, is we're pretty much done with Jason Todd. And I do just want to take a second to talk about missed opportunities, because we've had a few here um, as we go through what in my mind is actually a really, really great run on Batman, starting with Hush all the way up through the story arcs we're going to be going through today. Uh, Batman just could do no wrong. Like, all of these books were a lot of, at least a lot of fun, and sometimes really thought-provoking. However, um, admittedly, like, the critics would probably say, and they'd be absolutely right, that there were way too many missed opportunities during this time period in comics. Not only do um, you kind of lose track of the whole Jason Todd thing, and he does develop, you know, outside of the actual Batman title, but nevertheless, you know, not having him back in Batman proper at any point, basically for the rest of Volume 1 and into Volume 2 now, um, seems like a huge missed opportunity. Another thing is, um, you know, the whole War Games event, which, you know, was just sort of like this big grand idea that they seemed to have, but they were sort of already sort of locked into the return of Red Hood that, um, you know, they couldn't really do anything except whatever they could cram into three months. And so you have, you know, Leslie Tompkins and that whole story thread basically wiped clean and abandoned. Um, you have the death of Stephanie Brown wiped clean and abandoned. All of these are really, really major events that really could have been really built up a lot more, and I feel like they had a lot more story to tell in there, but they were so busy sort of getting onto the next big change that a lot of those things are lost. Now, you started seeing those missing sort of plot elements, these dangling ends that just kind of get abandoned, all the way back to Batman Hush. So let me take you back to the last issue, 619 of Batman Hush. And in it, amongst the many questions that he had answered, one of the biggest things that's left unanswered is what's going to happen to Harvey Dent. And um, at the end of Hush, we see that Harvey Dent is a full normal man, he's no longer Two-Face, he's had cosmetic surgery, and he is basically that straight shooter Harvey Dent that, you know, theoretically at least, that we knew way back in the long Halloween, for example. And um, that's a storyline that would have been really, really great to see, and see Harvey Dent back to normal, and see that on a month-to-month -month basis before things go awry. Unfortunately, it's another lost storyline, and what we get in one year later is his return, but unfortunately it's going to be um, a bit lackluster because we don't really get that Harvey Dent, of course. We are going to instead get Mr. Two-Face himself. <laughs> um, basically, <clears throat> you know, instead of really running with the Harvey Dent character and using that character again, he just basically is gone until he decides to melt his own face off and become Harvey Dent again. And what a disappointment that really was. Um, 
you know, when they brought him back and they were sort of playing with that character in one year later, there was a lot of, even though you knew he was still crazy and things were definitely going off the deep end, um, it would have been interesting to have him that way for just a little bit longer. And that was kind of a big signification of a lot of the things that went wrong with one year later. Um, is either the one year later stories were completely pointless or they were almost too impactful and they did too much too soon. Now, as we wrap up the return of Two-Face with issue 654, once again, he's basically abandoned for the majority of actually the entire volume one of Batman. He comes back towards the end, but he's pretty much gone. And the whole fact that he became Harvey Dent again is really just a a completely lost story thread in the graveyard of story threads that you can find throughout the 2000s in Batman, which is a big shame. Now, what do we get instead? After one year later, we are going to begin a very, very big odyssey through a very complicated storyline, one that's still playing out in comics today, and that is Grant Morrison's Super Run on Batman. Now, this is going to be a really, really difficult one to review because, as I said, it is kind of still going on. We still have Batman Inc. running, and Batman and Robin are running, and this whole phase of Batman's um, longevity as a character really hasn't quite been resolved yet, so I'm going to do my best to review this with positives and negatives and not be too harsh one way or the other. However, I will say that people tend to fall sort of on one side or the other when it comes to Grant Morrison's run. Either they love it or they absolutely despise it. Um, James Donnelly, I know, is someone who really dislikes it, dislikes it, and I have to admit myself that I was not a big fan of this, and um, with the exception of this first arc, things really are going to kind of go downhill for Batman after this, which is a real shame. Uh, but it's going to be really interesting to talk about, and I want you to keep watching because I want your opinion on this. I want to talk about R.E.P. with you guys. Um, the reason why we're kicking off Grant Morrison's run today rather than waiting for tomorrow is because this is the arc that I do actually really like, and this is Batman and Son. Um, this is the basically the arc where you have the return of Talia al Ghul, you have the return of Man-Bats as these crazy ninjas that Batman is um, combating and they're you know, allied with, allied with the League of Assassins, which what a great idea is that. And then at the end of this issue, you get the big revelation, which is that Talia al Ghul and Batman have a child in Damien. Now, Damien is obviously someone very familiar to all of you out there who, you know, even if you just picked up with the New 52, I'm sure you know who Damien is, um, and the sort of, you know, love-hate relationship you have with him in the sense that he is sometimes pure evil, um, sometimes he's a total, you know, prick, and other times you feel like he's coming into his own as Robin. And, you know, really early on here, he's pretty much just pure evil. And as we wrap up this first story arc with Damien, he is, you know, beating up Alfred and locking him in rooms. He's, you know, beating Tim Drake nearly to death. He's stealing Jason Todd's costume out of the Batcave to try and fight as Robin against Batman's wishes. And um, the future of Batman is very up for grabs at this point. Now, the reason why I do really enjoy this storyline, first of all, the art by Andy Kubert is absolutely phenomenal in this. Um, Andy and Adam Kubert jumped on DC at the same time, so Andy Kubert got Batman, and Adam Kubert got Superman in Action Comics, and um, it was a great time to be reading both those books, because you did have that brother, um, brother versus brother sort of competition going on. Uh, one of them was more successful than the others, but that's something for outside of the Batman videos to talk about. And um, the other thing is it really reminds me of a lot of set 70s Bronze Age Batman. Uh, back in the, and during that time, you had a lot of Man Bats, um, or I should say, a lot of Man Bat stories. Man Bat actually got his own storyline, or I'm excuse, <laughs> not his own storyline. He got his own title for a little bit in the uh, 70s or 80s, I believe. And with Talia al Ghul and the League of Assassins, it just feels like you know, almost as if Denny O'Neill is back editing Batman, and yet he's not, you know, he's long gone at this point. So anyway, I do really like this first story arc, but what comes later is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more difficult to love. And I'm really excited to talk with you guys about it and, let, and uh, see what you guys think. So I'm excited for the next couple of days. We're going to cover 
we're going to tackle the big Grant Morrison beast that is his Batman run in the late, the mid to late 2000s. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you again tomorrow.